When a man lies, he murders some part of the world. These are the pale deaths which men must call their lives. All this I cannot bear to witness any longer. Cannot the kingdom of salvation take me home? My name is Connie Burton, and I am Cliff's older sister. I'm the eldest out of three. There was Scott, Cliff, and myself. But Scott was the middle brother. Cliff, the bass player for Metallica. We want to put that in there, okay? The original on Kill 'Em All, Ride the Lightning, and Master of Puppets was Cliff Burton playing bass. Yes, we're very proud of him for that. A funny childhood memory that I have of Cliff. Okay, the first thing that comes to my mind, and I thought this was hysterical. I was only about seven years old, uh, six years old. Cliff was, um, very young, uh, I mean, what, four? I was out playing with the kids one day, and I went up to Cliff and I said, Cliff, why don't you come and play with us? You know, um, we're all playing down the street. No, no, I'm, I'm doing something here. And I looked at his hands, and he had a lizard in one hand, and something of a homemade scalpel-like in the other hand. And so I asked him, what are you doing? <laughs> and he said to me, I want to be a brain surgeon when I'm older. So um, I'm going to um, dissect the brain of this lizard so that I can see how it works and what's inside of there and everything so I can become a brain surgeon. And I said, oh, okay. <laughs> Cliff didn't have interest in playing with the kids since he was born. It was just on his own path. One thing I, I will share, it's um, not funny or anything, but it's very interesting. When he was a baby, he used to rock back and forth like this all the time. All, I mean, for hours and hours. And my mom and I used to say, what do you think he's going to be when he grows up? Okay? And I, I thought, well, maybe a parachuter, because they swing side to side, right? And my mom says, maybe a swimmer, because they have to go side to side, right? Well, little did we know, Cliff was headbanging when he was a baby. <laughs> he just couldn't go like this yet, because then the baby's neck doesn't do that. <laughs> and so he went side to side. It's a God-given gift that he had, and obviously since birth he was charged and ready to go. I'm Tori, I'm the lead vocals for Digital Panic. These are my friends. They're in the band. <laughs> <laughs> my dad's really into rock in general. But as a little kid, like he would listen to harder stuff. Uh, Metallica was one in particular. And they were probably, I guess, like the gateway band to the kind of music that I do now, heavier stuff. They were the first like screaming, yelling, crazy band that I listened to as a little kid. And my parents even have like home videos of me rocking out as like an infant to the <laughs> early albums. And you wouldn't think little well, itty bitty baby would be on the couch with his head baby into Metallica. That was me. Sunglasses. <laughs> With the sunglasses and everything. Cliff, as a bassist back then, he's extremely influential on like bass players now. I kind of stayed into them my whole life. Um, I've actually been to a few concerts now in my adult age with my father and met them a few times, so it's kind of cool. They honestly like made me less afraid to be so uh, crazy with music. Um, my mom's really into like alternative stuff, so she's more like stay modest or stay more like simple. And my dad's like, no, you can go for it. You can be crazy thrashy and just be all out with music and that made me want to do like screaming and what I do now or even like shouting and just be like crazy on stage and have my hair fly over the, all over the place because of how they were seeing them growing up and that just really pushed me to be that way in my music. Cliff came home one day and he was in trauma at the time. He was very upset because they didn't want him to elaborate, um, extenuate, add to do his thing that was his thing. The guitar player complained, you're playing my parts, dude. 
You can't be playing my parts. Cliff said, I'm not playing your parts. I'm just adding to it. Don't you see? I'm, it's, it's making the music better. Well, uh, that was not ever settled. So Cliff came home and he says to me, look, they don't want me to play these parts. They don't want me to play this. And he was playing his guitar at the time when I went in his room to talk to him. He would switch back and forth from guitar to bass to get all of his composition down and such like that. I said to him, Cliff, you're going to have to learn how to put the two together. If you can't put the two together, all right, the, the guitar and the bass, then either you conform or you leave the band, right? It's up to you. And he said, uh, put them both together. And I said, yeah. So Cliff goes down to the music store <laughs> in San Leandro, uh, Rick's All Music. He asked him if he could put a lead pickup in his bass guitar. Rick said, I don't know. I have no idea, Cliff. I don't even know if it'll work. But if you want me to, I'll do it and let, we'll see. So he put the lead pickup in his bass guitar and it worked. <laughs> it worked for Cliff. And he was able to play then his bass, but still have that lead in there. So that's where he got the saying, the saying came from that he was lead bass player. I know that God was leading Cliff, even though Cliff was not a Christian, as I know it anyway. I think it was God inspired. I feel that in my spirit. When I would look at my brother Cliff playing the guitar he started out playing, there was many songs that he played by that he would play the guitar first, and then he'd go to his bass and take what he got from the guitar and try to apply it to the bass. And with all those wah pedals and everything like that, he did a pretty good job. Cliff Burton as a musician has always impressed me. Uh, ever since I started listening to Metallica back in high school, I remember when my friends and I would sit around listening uh, to specific songs such as Pulling Teeth, and someone would say, well, that's the bass right there, that's the bass player. And I remember it blowing my mind, like that's the bass, this, how does this guy get this bass to sound like this, what is he doing? Uh, typically, you know, growing up in the 80s and hearing a lot of uh, rock and metal, a lot of the bass players were in the background and they didn't come out in the forefront, but someone like Cliff Burton was always right there doing something, uh, kind of pioneering uh, the, the style of, of bass and metal music. And so he always impressed me and has left that legacy for me as a musician who sometimes could, could have been in the background but has moved himself forward and has set an example for everyone going forward, guitarists, uh, drummers, bass players as well. You don't have to be so simple with your bass lines. It doesn't have to be on one string and you don't have to just be a simple player. You can be more complex. And I think Cliff opened that door for music now. Like her, I grew up with Metallica and heavier rock music. I didn't really, I didn't pay much attention to it back then, but uh, hearing him play with distortion stuff, I play with distortion and all kinds of stuff. So it's pretty cool to, to hear he did that so long ago. The Orion track, it was, uh, it was pretty cool because um, their bassists are supposed to stay in with the drums, like be not do much to stand out, really just hold it down, hold the rhythm down. And in that track, it sounded like he was going a little bit beyond that. And being borderline guitarist, Cliff took it in a completely new direction where the, the bass could be able to shine in a whole new way and and uh, you could listen to a, a Metallica track from back then and the, the bass can be just as important as the guitar when it comes to music. He wrote and played parts like he was playing a guitar, like it was really cool. You could have the bass do like a, a guitar riff type part which would let the guitars go off and do something completely different. I'll just go, hey I'll play something like a guitar part and they can do it. And he started that. Wouldn't be doing that if it weren't for him. Incredible. That live performance, that solo, uh, man, I, I didn't know you could do that on a bass. <laughs> that was phenomenal.
My mom dragged us to the bowling alley at a very young age because she was in the women's bowling league. And uh, Cliff, I love you, Cliff. He knows I do. He was the most uncoordinated. <laughs> and you wouldn't think that by the way he played the bass. All right, they, this was an uncoordinated person. But he was. And, uh, <laughs> and so we were on the Bantam League. Cliff um, entirely failed. <laughs> we didn't want him on our team and we were very upset <laughs> that we didn't want him on our team, okay? <laughs> because uh, his bowling uh, ability was <laughs> not up to par and we weren't going to win with him. So <laughs> um, he was kind of upset about that. I think the other thing was when Cliff attempted to swim, my mom wanted him to have swimming lessons. Now Cliff died and he did not know how to swim, okay? And it was quite hilarious to me when they put him in the water and the poor kid would, uh, Cliff, he, he just was completely petrified by the water. And so he screamed and yelled and proceeded to drown himself or whatever <laughs> he was trying to do. <laughs> but it wasn't follow what the teacher was trying to teach him. He was a journeyman fisherman, Cliff was. My mom started him out with the fishing pole because my mom was the fisherwoman of the house. My dad didn't fish or hunt or anything like that. He was a reader. He decided that he had seen books and he had um, read and studied in school how the Indians used to stab the fish. And different fishermen used to stab the fish with this long pole that had a, a you know, some kind of hook or arrow on the end of it or what have you. He made his own um, staff with a, um, uh, arrow on the, a metal arrow on the end of it, duct taped it all together and everything like that, all good, right? And we went fishing and he decided, we went to the pier usually with my mom out at Lake Chabot in, Cal in Castro Valley, California. Cliff would get out on the pier and um, he would get out on the pier and he'd stand there and he'd wait. It'd be about this time at night, so I think it's about, what time is it? Quarter to five. The, between five and 6.30 was the times when the fish would come up, you know, low tide and everything, and they'd come. So Cliff would stand there and he'd wait and he'd wait patiently, he'd wait patiently for the fish to come up there, big bass, big catfish come up, stab him right there at the pier, okay? And pull him out of the water. And that's the way he fished <laughs> for many, many, many years. That's the way Cliff fished. And um, nobody was talking him out of it that as far as he was concerned, this was the way to go. And he loved it. He just loved it. I still have all his fishing poles and stuff like that that he has. And he used to go out with Jim Martin uh, from Faith No More, who is very, I want to, like this with Cliff, they're just brothers in arms, in life, and uh, death, even. They'd go out to the San Mateo Pier, and my mom and I and my dad used to get so worried about Cliff, because he couldn't swim. Back to the swimming thing, right? <laughs> And we were so scared because he'd go out there with Jim, they'd go out there in the middle of the night and fish and have a great time, you know, and it was his time away from everything and everybody, you know, out there with nobody else even fishing in the middle of the night, except for them. And he, he just loved that space and that time. But we were always so afraid that he'd fall in and he didn't know how to swim. <laughs> So we really didn't like him going to the pier so much. We weren't all enthused about that, the big fish that he brought home, <laughs> as opposed to him, you know, perhaps accidentally drowning. But that's not the way it was going to go, so. So he didn't. <laughs> but he had a lot of fun. His hobby from the time he was 13 years old was that bass, was music when he was uh, faced with the um, dilemma 
of not having a company who made a head that produced the kind of tone that, and effects that he wanted. And so I told him, well, uh, why don't you go to, to the junior college and take a course in electronics and then you can build your own. He said, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. So he went to the college, Chabot College in Hayward, California. He took a few semesters there and he uh, came back home one day and was so frustrated and he said, I don't need all this. They want me to take English as a requirement for the advanced electronics class, right? And they want me to take history and physical ed and all these prerequisites and I don't have time for that and I'm not interested in that. He had a single focus from the time that my brother Scott died and that focus was to be the best musician he could be. Uh, and he did that. So he went to the school and once it got too much for him, I said, uh, look, I have an idea. Quit your classes there at the school, go to the school library, buy the advanced electronics books from the school bookstore and read them yourself and build your own. He was like, what? You know, that's an idea, but that's kind of way out there. And um, he says, yeah, I think I'll try that. You know, so he went and he quit his classes, he bought the books, and two months later he built the head that he needed. And one of the guys still has it, I think it's Jim Martin from Faith No More. I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure that that's who has it. Either that or Mike Borden from Faith No More and from Ozzy. Hi, I am Andriy Vasilenko. Cliff's headbanging was an extension of his music. It happened every time he took the bass. And not only on stage in front of thousands of fans on live performances, but also in the isolation of studio recordings. According to Fleming Grasmussen, Cliff just couldn't sit down and play the parts. He needed to move and hand bang. That might look like a guy just playing the bass and moving his head. But actually there's more than Miss D.I. in Cliff's headbanging. He could manage even the most complicated and syncopated beats this way. Which proves that Burton had an exceptional ear for music. He was a living metronome, so to speak. Cliff had expanded the boundaries of both bass playing and stage presence. The headbanging that developed in his bedroom before headbanging was headbanging like Rich Banger said, a very good friend of ours, who is now deceased, but um, he said, bang that head that doesn't bang. He would go into a uh, state of mind and of spirit that excelled all else but the music that Cliff was playing at the moment. And within himself, his own personal timing to the individual composer of each song, his headbanging was a natural, automatic thing um, that, just, that he just did. He couldn't help it. He would come home sometimes and say, I, I need a chiropractor to go on the road with me. My, my neck hurts so bad. And he wouldn't take any drugs to quail that. He did drink to quail it. And that was one of the reasons that he would say that he did drink was um, because of the pain that, from the head banging some of the times. But he couldn't help head banging. He couldn't stop it. It was a natural uh, response of his body to being in the music. The schedule was grueling. He was so committed and so dedicated to his music, he was married to his music. That was his first priority, you see. Girls weren't his first priority. His fishing, which was his hobby, that he did successfully do. Everything came second. Everything came second to Cliff. Cliff would practice anywhere from six to eight hours a day in his bedroom. 
and if you wanted to talk to him, you had to um, go into his room. He'd come out, but he'd be carrying his uh, base, all right? And uh, he'd come out and say, you know, what do you want? You know, what is it? What do you need? And uh, then it would be, come into my bedroom and talk to me. I, I need to practice, you know, I'm practicing. And you had to either go with Cliff doing that and practicing while the same time he listened to you, or you didn't talk to him. You know, that was your choices. At the time of joining Metallica, Cliff had already become an experienced player with more than 11,000 hours of practicing bass that he'd been doing since the age of 13. This is how his feeling of the instrument, of the music, he played, reached almost physical level. He would practice every single day, except for Sundays, once in a while. And I don't know the reason why he picked Sundays, okay? He, I never asked him and he never told me. You know, it wasn't a big deal. It was just at that point in time. I wasn't saved yet either, so I wasn't connecting all the dots. Uh, things going on, you know, and God working in our lives and things like that. I do know one thing, and um, uh, I'll share it. I don't know what it means. I don't know what the, the message is there, although I feel it's somewhat important. It led Cliff to a place of creativity, um, imagination, where he decided that he was going to try to play his bass underneath a blanket. And he specifically chose an army blanket. He was very patriotic, okay? We had an old arm, green army jacket, uh, blanket, wool blanket. I walked into his bedroom uh, one day to talk to him, and he had this blanket over him. Okay, and his, he's got his hands outside the blanket. The bass is inside the blanket. And he's trying to play the bass through an army blanket. And thank you for all of you who have done service and are doing service in our armed forces of the United States of America. God be with you always. And he is. <laughs> so anyway, he's trying to, and I said, what are you doing and what are you high on, right? And he says, nothing, but I'm trying to play my bass, see if it'll work. If I can play it through a blanket. I don't need to do this on stage. He goes, if it works, I would. <laughs> but it didn't work. He couldn't get it, get the action going there with the blanket in between. So <laughs> anyway, that, that story there with the blanket, I just find... Uh, it was just a show of imagination of things that Cliff would try. He tried many different things. He wasn't afraid to try things. I could go to sleep, and I did, at sound checks, all right, where the band is blaring loud, right? And they're trying to dial them in in the sound booth. They say, Connie, I can't believe it. She's asleep. <laughs> okay. Yeah. If I needed sleep, I could sleep anywhere. My parents were a different story. And it was so funny because my mom would get up and, uh, or in the daytime, if it was daytime, and come into Cliff and say, oh my, goodness, you have to turn that down. I cannot take it, all right? You have, you've got to turn it off. No, mom, I can't turn it off. I can't stop. Well, finally he got a rock man, so he could hook it up and have the headphones and everything like that, which he hated. So during the day, he would play without the rock man when I was just there and my parents were at work. And I was never bothered by it. I heard um, Metallica songs over and over and over again. I've heard pieces and bits and pieces of them being put together, you know, all of that. It was just part of my life. So for me, it was great. My parents, my mother was like, how are you gonna make a living off of being a musician? Cliff was like, I'm just gonna do the best I can. I wanna be able to support a family and children by playing music. I don't think he had uh, any 
projecting in his head, particularly a vision that went along with that, other than to be the best musician he could be, you know, for his brother. I think without Cliff, there wouldn't have been a Metallica to start with. You know, it's not to say that Metallica hasn't done amazing things and are as good as they ever were um, after Cliff's death, but you know, he was one of the pillars that started it all. His songwriting, his his presence in performing live, his style. So I don't. We can never say what would have happened if Cliff wasn't there, but I don't think Metallica would have been Metallica without Cliff. When Scott died, Cliff and I's world fell apart. Scott and my Nana were the only people that I admitted that I loved in this world, and that I would show a type of kindness and affection for, because unfortunately I was a hater. My motto was F the world, and everybody in it, including you, I didn't care. I was being biased or anything, racist or anything, you know? It was a, <laughs> the world's included. <laughs> and when Scott died, that missing piece of his spirit being absent from our family was duly noted by the entire family. You could tell that the family dysfunction had even grown further uh, after his death. Instead of bringing things closer, um, I ended up in the psychiatrist's office two months later because I looked around the world and I hated everybody and everything. <laughs> and the only person that I admitted I had loved was gone from this planet. So I was really, really messed up in, uh, spiritually and emotionally. It was a very life-changing experience for me. Cliff took it and did the opposite of what his sister did. His drive and passion was like I said before, to be the best musician he could be for his brother. And that drove him and drove him. My name is Mark Nigro. Probably the most active band as far as performing live that I was involved with was a glam rock band in the late 80s called Rising Star. We were out of North Central Jersey as our manager. Phil Coyne basically put the band Kiss on the map. Metallica was probably the most influential band um, in my album collection at the time. Uh, and those are influences you don't even realize are influencing you, you know, it just happens so organically. It's funny, I look back and um, when I look at the song titles and who wrote the song, I didn't even pay attention to that. Looking back at who wrote what, you know, I realized how much Cliff influenced me, both in his um, his, his, his melodic structures, his melancholy, melancholic lyrics, you know, Fade to Black, um, probably one of the best ballads ever written in my opinion. His melodies and the higher octaves, you know, that whole style that influenced me, which came out over time when I would write bass lines. And when I was into Metallica, it was my first year of playing guitar. I remember hearing things and not having a lot of exposure at the time because I was still new to the whole scene. I didn't know how certain sounds were created, so I'd hear stuff on albums and be like, how do they do that? And uh, you know, the, those, the fuzz waz and stuff like that, that's, that's one of those things that I thought, how does he get that sound? I'll never forget the first time I listened to Orion specifically for the bass line. And when it changed from 4-4 to 6-4, I just felt like I had my mind blown. So here's a bass player who's playing 32nd notes along with the guitar players. Sometimes, and then other times, he would play eighth notes while they were playing 32nd notes. He, it, it seemed like he had to find a way to solidify something that was really a freight train. Their music was just a freight train. And it needed a heavy backbone. So 
There were other bass players that, that did that sort of thing. A uh, bass player from Black Sabbath, Geezer Butler, was well known for being an anchoring uh, force behind that band. But when you're the bass player in a band like Metallica, you are the anchor. I mean, you're the musical anchor along with the drummer. So his role is probably bigger than even he would have realized back then. Because without that anchor, the train goes off the track. Anyone who is starts to be deified in this industry, or you get to that point where fans are lifting you up to the point, you're either going to go one of two ways. You're going to just embrace it and let it go to your head, or it's going to cause problems for you, and you're not going to like it. You're going to reject it. And that's the humble people. That's the humble ones. And you know the ones that are humble like that. And there are a lot of musicians out there that don't like the fact that people try to... And it's a natural course of things. The fame and fortune part of it, Cliff had a severe problem. Severe problem. He did not accept. He would not accept what comes with fame and fortune. And like I told him at one time, look, you're going to have to make peace with this. Because it comes with being the best musician you can be, obviously. All right? It's obvious. It's here. It's a, you're in it. He had a certain disdain, I will say, okay? Cliff wasn't a hater, but he did not like the fame and the fortune part. He didn't know how much money he had in the bank. He didn't have a bank account. My mother, it was in my mother's name. And he didn't want anything to do with it. And he was born to leave at the time he left because that was just when he was really having to face incorporating fame and fortune into being the best musician he could be. And it had gotten to a point where it was literally ripping at his spirit. You could tell it was ripping at his soul. Um, one time we were standing backstage and um, it was a meet and greet, VIP room. And I was standing next to him and um, I, I it was a break in the, in the people. And um, so we had a little space there for a minute. And he was shaking his head back and forth. I knew, I could feel there was something wrong, you know? And um, I said to him, Cliff, what's going on? And this is not to put down any fans at all. I'm telling you what Cliff, what Cliff was in his mind, in his heart. He said, they call me some kind of God. They treat me like some kind of God or something. But I'm not. I'm just a man. Okay? And no, he wasn't Jesus Christ. He wasn't God. Okay? People out there, he was not God. He was Cliff Burton, Clifford Lee Burton, and he played that bass like Bader Rager, no other could. <laughs> Has since, anyway. <laughs> and we're proud of that. He looked down at me and he said, I just can't take it. I. I it made him very sad that uh, people were not connecting with him uh, or would connect with him and think that he was something more and something like God, okay? To him, that was not okay because he's not God and, he, and nowhere near it, none of us are. We're all sinners here on earth, you know, in need of Jesus Christ. When the management companies would come around and things like that, right, he didn't want to be there. He didn't want any part of it. But when they came into the studio to critique the music that was going on the album and then wanting to change some of that music to make it more mainstream, more sellable, or what have you, more catchy tune, Cliff was the first one to say no, no, no and no. And he would sit there and he didn't like it, but he would sit there and make sure that his voice was heard for them not to do anything with the music. He was very adamant about that. We do what we want to do, you know. If they consider that selling out, then uh, whatever. There's a lot of people think you sold out just because you're on a major label and are very popular. 
or maybe you don't play a thousand miles an hour the whole time or you know I'm not trying to be something big and fancy you know it's just us doing what we do and to keep it that way for me this was the whole god thing because i prayed even though i wasn't born again yet i prayed what can help me with my brother to help my brother and what he was going to wear because Metallica was insisting you got to put on the spandex, the high top tennies, right? And Cliff was like, no way. Okay, he came home. He was so, very upset, very upset. I'm not doing the spandex and the high tops, okay? You've got the spandex and the high tops on, that's fine, right? <laughs> I'm not doing it. I said, okay, well, let's try this. So we went shopping. He uh, very grudgingly went shopping with his big sister, right? And I picked out a pair of black pants like I have on here, straight leg pants, okay? You can't probably see all the way to the bottom, but it doesn't matter. Anyway, they were black straight leg pants. I said, why don't you try on a pair of moccasins with them, you know? All right, <laughs> I don't know where I was going with that, except for it wasn't high top tannies, okay? It wasn't Ralph Lauren, <laughs> all right? Maybe it was something my brother would wear. I was hoping. So he tried them on, and his immediate reaction was, no way. All right. He looked in the mirror and he said, no, I'm not doing this. I'm going to wear my jeans and my tennis shoes. And I said, Cliff, you can't wear your jeans and your tennis shoes. Your jeans have got holes in them. Your tennies are all worn out, right? At least buy a new pair of tennis shoes, you know? to go on stage with it, you know what I mean? Come on. He's like, no, no, these are fine. The name of the band was Blush. It was um, 1979, 1980. I formed that band and brought my crew up from San Diego. And we, we played all over Hollywood, Los Angeles, so the club scene for about three or four years before we finally broke up. I remember the parachute pants um, was a big thing. I, the, my singer insisted, you know, she's going to dress me. You got to, we got to get these, um, these cool pants. A store called Judy's. It was an all girls clothing store in the San Gabriel Valley, or whatever. I just remember doing my shopping there. Got the zebra shirt, the white and black striped shirt, parachute pants. <laughs> This is my son, Elijah. Elijah is an awesome bass player. Early metallic music influenced by Cliff, obviously, with his bass lines and stuff, I'd say that it's significantly more enjoyable than a lot of the metal that I hear on the radio now. Just from a bassist perspective, he seems like he values like having fun over the flashiness of the playing and that spirit of his is kind of lacking in a lot of metal music today. He was very street. He just wore denim jackets and it looked like he just got out of bed and, and didn't even comb his hair and got on the stage. He was a great looking guy. He seemed to be uh, just a natural rocker and he seemed to ha be a very personable guy. Um, I don't think that he uh, thought much about image except just to connect with the kids that were coming out to see them. He was basically one of them. And he did the same thing with his car, which, uh, <laughs> okay. His Volkswagen, the Grasshopper, everybody knows the Grasshopper. Volkswagen station wagon, 1974. And he would not buy a new car either, even when he missed the plane to France. I and mean, Metallica lost their group rate that time because Cliff wasn't on the plane because his car broke down. And his car would break down when he was on his way to rehearsal. And when he was on his way to get whatever, okay? And Cliff, I said to him one day, Cliff, he had his steering wheel. You guys literally duct taped to the steering column of his car. <laughs> because he played the bass while he was driving. And he'd flip in tapes and he'd bang just like he banged on his guitar, he banged on the steering wheel. When I finally told him, Cliff, 
it, you really need to buy a new car. No, no, this one's fine. This one's fine. It hasn't, it's not dead yet. I said, I said, Cliff, it's dead, huh? Really? The thing, <laughs> the thing breaks down on you all the time. It's dead. No, no, it's still good. I said, look, is all you have to do is call up the place. You don't even have to go down there and just tell them what kind of car you want, what color, and they'll deliver it. You have that much money. Do you understand? Yeah, I understand, but this car's good, and these jeans will be fine, and these tennies will be fine, and that's what he was comfortable in, and that's what he wore, and he did not care what anybody else thought at all. That was Cliff, El Natural. I think the kindness and most compassionate, most kind and generous thing uh, from the heart that um, happened between me and my brother was a very memorable moment and it changed my life um, forever. I was very much into my drug addiction and alcohol and whatever else I could get a hold of. And I showed up at a gig in San Francisco that Metallica was doing. And my brother had expressed to me that um, he was uh, very disappointed and that also he was very concerned about me going backstage after the gigs because I would be really blasted. There's MTV back there, there's people wanting to do interviews and such like that. And here, I was a really mean drunk. Uh, I would make a spectacle of myself and you, <laughs> you know? It didn't matter to me. I was at a very bad stage in life. And I showed up at this gig and I was completely clean and sober. I hadn't had a drink, I hadn't had a drug. And I went backstage afterwards. Cliff literally saw me, stood up, and started crying. It's the only time in my life I saw him cry, that he let me see him cry. And he just gave me a big hug and told me that he loved me and that he was so proud of me. He was so happy that I wasn't drunk and that I wasn't on drugs. That right there changed my life concerning drugs and alcohol. It was a very big moment and my brother and I, in our closeness and our love that we had for each other, um, his expression of his gratitude was so overwhelming and so overbearing kind of uh, the way he expressed it that it hit my spirit. And God came in and hit my spirit too to say this is something that we need to deal with. He was a man of uh, great humility, uh, great kindness. He had a type of compassion for the world uh, and the people in it. I see that he expressed it in his music. Like for instance, Orion, For Whom the Bell Tolls, Anesthesia Pulling Teeth. Things that Cliff came up with on his own uh, in his bedroom. Playing Fades Black just took me back to my teens when I was learning songs from Metallica for the very first time. It took me back to that whole era of my life. And I, I think one of the reasons why I connected so well, loved the, the, the music of Metallica so much, is because of their their message. They had meaning in their songs, and they, and they you know, the, the solemn of a lot of their lyrics, that's where I was in life. And so it, it kind of brought me back. I mean, I don't have those same feelings now. I don't have that despondency that I had in my teens, but it was like it brought me back for a moment. I kind of went into a time machine, I felt like. And um, just remember the days of sitting in my room for hours listening to Metallica, other bands, and learning songs off off the records and uh, being determined to become, you know, the greatest metal rock player of all time. I'd like to think that Cliff was intentional in reaching out to people through his lyrics and music. You know, as a songwriter myself, 
I think that um, it's it's difficult to not mean what you write. You know, there's so much that does genuinely come from inspiration that I wouldn't think Cliff fabricated anything. I think it came from his own emotional experiences in life, you know, his own thought processes. But um, being willing to share those things with people through your music is, is definitely a way to reach them, connect with them, express yourself to them. In 1985, probably late 1985 and 1986, my friends and I started listening to Metallica. Uh, we had listened somewhat to their original album that they released, Kill 'Em All, but we really started digging in when the album Ride the Lightning came out. And on that album, there were two songs in particular that really resonated with us. One was For Whom the Bell Tolls, and the other one, my favorite, probably Metallica song of all time, was Fade to Black. Metallica came along with these face-melting bars of music, but then they wove into that music a lot of classical music, which was so different from all of the rest of the metal bands at the time. So uh, Cliff Burton, from what I understand, was one of the major influences of that because he studied classical music on the piano when he was about 13 years old. In fact, after I heard that song, I signed up for classical guitar at my high school because I wanted to learn how to play the classical guitar and uh, play music with our band in the high school at the time. Uh, every day at lunch, we would ride to lunch listening to the song Fade to Black. I had a friend that would play the song over and over again, all the way to the store, all the way back. And that kind of led to a point where our band decided that we wanted to learn how to play the song as well. So one day, my friend Munchmeyer came over to my house and we sat down on my back porch and I pulled out a piece of paper and I wrote down by hand all of the lyrics to Fade to Black. And as he played along on the guitar, I sat in the backyard singing it so that we could get ready for a band session that we were going to have. When the whole get together was done, I, I just left the paper on the back porch. I didn't even notice that I had done it and I went on about my business. And uh, what I didn't know was that my mom came out onto the back porch that afternoon and she found the lyrics written in my handwriting. It wasn't attributed to anybody. I didn't write Metallica on it or the name of the song. I just had the lyrics. And she thought that I had written the song. And the lyrics were incredibly dark and depressing and she was incredibly afraid that I was depressed and going through uh, a really dark time in life. At the time in my life, I was just thinking, I thought the music was incredible. I thought the lyrics, you know, they were, they were dark, but they, they, were, they were powerful. They kind of hit a young person in a way that you never know how it's gonna hit them. So years and years and years go by uh, from 1985, I guess it would have been, or 86, until I was getting ready to be ordained and go into ministry and start uh, The Well, the church that I'm a pastor of. And on the day of my ordination, after I was ordained, my mom came up to me at a party that we were having to celebrate. And she said, uh, Todd, I want to show you something. And she reached into her purse and she pulled out this piece of paper and she said, do you know what this is? And I said, no, I don't really recognize it. And when she handed it to me, it was the handwritten copy of the words to fade to black that I had written and left on the back porch. And she handed it to me and she started to cry and she said, when I found this note, I knew that you must have been going through some kind of dark time. And I just took that and put it in my purse. And I want to let you know that I started praying for you, that whatever it was that you were going through, that God would guide you through it. To know that my mom devoted 14 years of praying for me, for God to intercede in my life, was a powerful moment for me, a powerful way to start ministry. And then I was equally kind of heartbroken when I had to inform her that I didn't write the song, that it was by a band called Metallica, and that, that even still I appreciated her prayers. So I would say that Cliff Burton and the influence that he had in those years uh, with Metallica definitely impacted my own life, ministry, and music and gave me some insight into some things that otherwise I maybe would have not been as attentive to. My name is Simon Woodstock. I use notable shred music for evangelism and outreach. I saw Metallica at the Cow Palace just outside of San Francisco in the late 80s. I was like in my late teens. Pantera opened up for them. And the mosh pit was just insane. 
And I remember when Metallica set started, the bass waves were just hitting me. Like it was making my head swim and it, like my chest cave in. The thing is though, it was Jason Newstead. It wasn't until years later that I learned about Cliff Burton, a, a VHS tape came out called Cliff em All. And I watched it and it was so cool. You know, it was just like roughly edited together. And it told these stories of Cliff and his music and his career with Metallica. But honestly, it was hard to fathom. Like, I was like, how did this guy, Cliff Burton, have already had like iconic status as a bass player and fans worldwide and then have died like that on tour. Like I was just kind of tripping out. It's like I, my brain didn't want to comprehend it or something. And I didn't think a whole lot of it moving forward. But then now revisiting his career and learning his music on guitar and even on bass a little bit, you kind of get behind the scenes into the mastermind that was Cliff Burton that you know, assembled those tablatures and assembled those notes in the way that he did. You just see, it's almost scientific how he put uh, his music together and it's very enjoyable to play. And I would say this, when it comes to skill, um, style, and just all around uniqueness, I think Cliff's music is unparalleled even to this very day. You asked me about his Misfits tattoo, and is that a tribute toward Glenn Danzig or not? No, it definitely is not. Um, the only reason, and I, I was so upset when Cliff came home with the tattoo, and I was like, dude, why did you have to pick that tattoo of all the skulls in the world that there are? Okay, you picked that one. Why did you pick that one? He said, because everybody else has skull tattoos and they all look the same. Now this is, Cliff was very, uh, his individuality, his originality was so integrated into him, all right, and was him. He went out for the one skull that was different from all the rest that we see out there. We've all seen skulls. Well, there's, million different types of skulls, but they do look all the same kind of the skulls. This skull definitely does look different. Cliff did not agree with the satanic way. He had a certain type, I'm going to put it that way, because it was a certain, uh, it was an odd type of admiration, sort of, for the elements of composition and harmony that Danzig, that Glenn Danzig came up with. And Cliff did take some of the things that originated from Glenn Danzig and incorporated it into um, some of his earlier music. Once he caught on though to his tattoo and to Glenn Danzig, and sorry dude, but you know, hex me if you will, uh, if that's what's going on, my brother was appalled by the actions, all right, of this particular group, this band. And I'm not going to make it uh, public exactly what was happened and the, the whole story behind that, uh, which I probably won't in my book either about Cliff. He did not uh, agree and, at all with their satanic rituals and religion. I don't want to say if my brother was a closet Christian, okay, because who knows? I never really asked Cliff, and he did not talk to me much about his belief in the Holy Bible. I was not saved yet, but to live is to die. He got uh, directly from watching the evangelist Billy Graham, which Cliff would watch three or four times a week, late at night when my parents were asleep and my mom would get up and go, shh, turn the TV down, you're waking us up. <laughs> and Cliff would make homemade nachos for us and the whole bit. And one day I asked him, why are you watching Billy Graham? You watch him all the time. You don't even believe in that stuff, do you? Well, I don't want to talk about that right now because the guy's preaching. 
you know. I said, why are you watching him? At first he kind of smirked and he said, well, it's entertaining. And then he looked at me and he just gave me the look like I'm getting something out of this. It's personal. It's intimate. Let's not go any further with it. You know, and that was look that he gave me, and I acknowledged that. I said something to the effect, well, you think Billy Graham is pretty good? He said, I think that what he has to say is very interesting, and I'm learning a lot about the Bible through what he's saying. And he continued to do that until the day he died, except when he was on tour and couldn't watch the TV, you know. And what I'd like to say with that is Cliff picked out the, the part to live is to die. Billy Graham was, uh, had preached quite a few times on where the Bible says, for those of you that don't know, the Bible rests on a point that says, dying to the flesh. The, this is what the words that are used, die to the flesh. And to live is to die. Cliff directly got from those Billy Graham sermons, okay, about us and in this world that we live in, with all of our stuff, okay, we have our water, right? And I have my coffee over there from Jack in the Box, you know? So we have the hamburgers and we have all kinds of things coming from us all over the world. And what this uh, means, this dying to the flesh, is when we're putting the world outside of ourselves, even though we're in the world, we're not of the world, okay? God is first on our minds, and God is what we think of first in our minds. Where we go when we don't know what to do, what do we do? Where do I go? What do, who do I ask for help? God, Jesus Christ, are always there. It feels like a lot of times our flesh is dying, which our flesh does. I mean, look at my hands. I'm 60 years old. They are withered and torn and worn. And that's the way that the flesh goes. It's the way that any material thing goes in this world, even though it is manifested by God. This earthly place is this, this earthly place of materialism. When a man lies, he murders some part of the world. These are the pale deaths which men miscall their lives. All this I cannot bear to witness any longer. Cannot the kingdom of salvation take me home? Cliff died in a uh, bus accident. Um, they were on tour. The bus tipped over and fell on top of him, threw him out the window, fell on top of him. And then when the crane came to lift the bus off of him, it broke and the bus fell back on him again for a second time. I do not believe this was any accident. It wasn't an accident. I believe it was an act of God. That's just my personal beliefs for everybody out there who doesn't believe in the Lord. I remember hearing the news of, uh, of Cliff's death and it's interesting because I never knew the members of Metallica personally. But when you're a fan, it's as if someone that you know and love has died. And so uh, it was hard to believe. and. Um, as much as they were metal gods for for me and those who love Metallica, it was a reminder to me that these gods are not immortal, and um, you know they die too. And and uh, I think anytime there's a death of someone you know or someone you look up to, it's uh, it's a reality check. You know, just a reminder that you are human. 
I was in the middle of bowling. And I was on the lane. I mean, I was out bowling <laughs> with the ball in my hand. I stopped in the middle of making my way to the line where you let go of the ball. And I turned around to the three people I was with. I said, I have to go call home. I put the ball back in the rack. They said, well, Connie, it's your turn. You know, you're gonna hold up the whole game. I said, well, that's too bad. I have to go to the phone. So I went and I called my, a home and my mother answered. And as soon as she said hello, I just knew. And uh, I said, it's Cliff, right? And she said, yeah. And I said, he's dead, right? And she said, yeah. And she said, I think you better come home right now. We had been out all night partying and such like that and then decided to go bowling. And it was nine o'clock in the morning. So I had to go back and we left the bowling alley. Cliff and I both knew that this tour that he was going on, I pleaded with him not to go, to call in sick. <laughs> I'm laughing because it's like Metallica, right? They're gonna, he's gonna call in, I'm too sick to go, I can't go, right? I begged him to call in sick. Just don't go this one time, this one time. He looked at me and he said, I know exactly what you mean, but I have to go. It's my job. He shook his head like this and just looked down. And he said, I love you, Con. That was the last time I saw him. That was at the airport when, when that happened. He knew he had done things, which I will uh, share in the book. He had done quite a few things that lets you know that a person is not returning or something is um, amiss uh, greatly. My name is David DePietro, and I was in the band TT Quick. We were signed to Megaforce Records on or about 1983, I believe. We met John and Marsha Zazula because they owned a store called Rock and Roll Heaven right over there on the Route 18 flea market. We were on tour and I'm not sure whether we were in Chicago or Cincinnati, but we were about to go on stage and it just so happened that Johnny Zazula was with us, uh, the founder of Megaforce Records, the guy who found and signed Metallica. And we were about to go on stage and Johnny came in and he had tears in his eyes and he broke the news to us that Cliff had been killed in Europe on, in a tour bus accident. And this is moments before we're gonna go on stage. And, you know, I remember being just blown away by that and blown away by, here are these guys who were part of something so big, their band was so big, and I remember having this thought that it's amazing that something that big could just come to an end that quickly and without notice. And that'll really make you think. That will really make you think what, what how temporary things can be. And I would have a lot more thoughts about that as, as time went on and that would lead me to be sitting in this church. Um, but we were very saddened. We, it was very hard to get up for a show hearing that. And I know that, that Johnny Z was just, it was as if he had lost a child. Because in a way he did. They were his baby, so to speak. So that was rough. And we happened to be among the first people to hear about it. Ponder, just think about like what the cliff mean. Why those are his lyrics, the kingdom of salvation. Where was he going with that? And what did he mean? What influences were on his life? The influence that the Lord was having on him, you know, to come up with lyrics like that didn't come fall out of the sky. Cliff had come to a place in life. Like he wrote, I cannot no longer bear to witness. Won't the kingdom of salvation take me out? Once again, we come to Billy Graham. Cliff learned of the kingdom of salvation that he was talking about from this evangelist and had made that um, part of his lyrics there to express his 
compassion and his real tragedy in some ways that uh, shortened his life, that he just was anti-culture when it came to this fame and fortune bit. The, being the best musician you can be, he was all on for. The rest of it he had terrible, real, really a hard, hard time in his spirit, down deep in his soul uh, with that. When you look at the lyrics of To Live Is To Die, you know, he collected them from philosophical poets and things, but we know now that he was influenced by Billy Graham. And Cliff, he did have a spiritual side to him. Uh, Creeping Death was his lyric, right? And that's in reference to what? The Exodus in the Bible, right? Death shall fall upon the firstborn Pharaoh's son. That's the Passover and the nation of Israel coming out of Egypt uh, under the leadership of Moses, you know? So it's not as though Cliff was uh, not in tune with spiritual things, you know, he knew about them. When a person thinks of Cliff dying at such a young age, age 24, they might say, well, that's so tragic, that's just wrong. And the notion of an all good God existing, well, that can't be true. Um, Cliff's death was wrong, therefore no such good God could exist. But the thing to keep in mind is that in order to say that something's wrong, or to say that something's evil or tragic, it presupposes the existence of an all good God. That is, in order to say, right, we want justice for all. And in order to make judgments like that, there needs to be a God that exists. C.S. Lewis once pointed out that in order to say that something's crooked, you need a straight standard by which to judge something as crooked or straight. And that straight standard is God. Now you might say, well, that's just some philosophical thing. How does that help us out? Well, it's just important to know because when things like this happen, when when Cliff died or, you know, years before that, his brother Scott Burton died from a brain aneurysm at a very young age, and that's very tragic. So those are very emotional things. And that's why we need God, because we can come to Him. And when we don't understand why things happen, we can have faith that God does understand why they happen and that they're part of his overall plan. So that can help us emotionally cope with things and to accept these tragic events when things like Cliff's death take place. Yes, yeah, so you're asking me about the look that the members in Metallica and people that were close to Cliff used to give me. I found out finally five years after Cliff died, I, had, I, I would periodically from Jim Martin, Mike Borden, Dave Dionato, some of the band members of uh, Trauma, uh, different people I would that were very, very close to Cliff, that knew Cliff, I would get this look. It was the same look from each person, periodically, this look. We were backstage after a Day on the Green gig that Metallica played. Kirk was right here, and Lars was here, and James was uh, a little bit in front of me. This look came, okay, again, from all of them at the same time. And so I turned to Kirk and I said, what is this look? Okay, I've been getting it for years. The only people that were close to Cliff, I don't know what it is and I wanna know now. I want you to tell me now, what are you thinking? What's going on for you? He started to cry. He got very upset. Lars got very upset. Uh, James was very upset. Kirk said to me, you look so much like Cliff. You act like him, you talk like him, your gestures are like him. Every time we look at you, we see Cliff. And we have not dealt with Cliff's death yet. We, I can't handle it. Uh, to look, at, to, to look at you, it brings up everything. And um, I said, okay, I got it. And I knew that that was the look that I was getting. And it made sense. It really made sense to me. It didn't make sense to me the reaction later on through the years that I've gotten, or no reaction, concerning this matter. So I, I really uh, pray to God that those men have worked out Cliff's death. And if you haven't, do it, you know, just do it. Uh, it'll cleanse and clear your heart. 
if uh, James Kirk and Lars and uh, I'll include Robert, although I've never met him, were here right now, what would I say to them? What would I would like to say to them? I would like to say I love you all. I love, I love you, Kirk. I love you, James. I love you, Lars. I would like people to know that Lars, whether he did, besides the Nabster thing, okay, and him being the one to go ahead and say, hey, I'm gonna put a stop to this. He was the one who was by my side when I was at my worst, hitting bottom and drugs and alcohol. Nobody knew what to do with me. I mean, including Ozzy, he was saying I was crazy. And if Ozzy says you're crazy, you know, <laughs> okay, something's gone really wire here. <laughs> um, uh, no offense, Ozzy, but <laughs> he's a free soul. I have to say that about Lars. I, 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 I owe special thanks to him and I love him dearly. And I was so messed up, I didn't have it in me to say, I need to go to rehab. You know, I, I was just too far gone. Really, in my mind, I had gone insane. What they, and um, was not dealing with sanity. So my decision making and my judgment was um, way out of whack. What I would say to the guys is I love you all. Um, I would like the relationship to be a relationship. I would love it to change. And I ask for their forgiveness for anything that I may have done or said in my um, uh, addiction that would have offended them or harmed them in any way because that I certainly did not mean to do. I thought I was gaining three brothers and I lost four. <laughs> it's not funny, but that's my way of covering up. I'm human too. There is no kingdom without forgiveness. We cannot enter the kingdom of salvation, the kingdom of God, without being forgiven by God, first of all. That is the entrance into the kingdom. It's to receive the forgiveness that God offers through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And now having been forgiven myself, I need to be able to forgive other people too. This is something that Jesus said, and, and, and which is also why the gospel transforms not only an individual's life, but other relationships. So as I'm forgiven, how can I not, you know, knowing all that God has forgiven me of, because I know the things I've done in life, how can I not then also show mercy to somebody else who's done something wrong against me when what that person has done can't even compare to what I've done to other people or before the Lord. So if I as a sinner have been forgiven, how can I not forgive somebody else who's just like me? I just want to say um, thank you to all of them also for going on in life and becoming the musicians they have become. I'm very proud of them. So I know them from when they were in their 20s, early 20s. What kind of men they have turned out to be, I do not know uh, at this point in time. I just say God bless you and uh, forgive me for anything that I've done that harmed anyone. What would you say to Cliff? If he was... I love you. And you're an amazing, fantastical human being, musician. You have turned out to be the best musician you could be for your brother Scott. And you've done that successfully. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. That's what I say to him. And then I say, let's watch some Billy Graham classics. Come on. <laughs>
came from the Cavalry Church uh, to the jail to do their ministry. So we all sat down and we had our Bible study. They began to share with me. They gave me a Bible, a woman's devotional. And once I read, I realized that there was a God. I was saved that night. After they had shared with me their knowledge, I felt led to invite Christ into my life. I had nothing to lose at the time. I was completely down and out. I saw Jesus in my mind as my eyes were closed. I saw him riding to me on a Harley Davidson, which I'm very much into Harleys and lived where I ride to live. And, and God be with us always. God, praise God for letting us ride. <laughs> he asked me, do you want to go for a ride? And so I got on the back of the Harley Davidson with Jesus Christ and off we went into the clouds, up, 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 wherever we went. <laughs> At that moment, I was born again. showcase for um, it was Alpha Omega Records. Eventually we, we the band broke up. I left the band. I mean, you know the old stories of the inner conflict between band members and all. So uh, the singer and I used to um, butt heads sometimes and the drummer and I. Because and, also the music was kind of like well, glam rock, bubblegum rock. My friend Scotty Hill from Skid Row used to call it. Things were going on inside of my heart and mind that no one knew in the outside world. I was very unhappy. I was sick of the lifestyle that I was living, just always partying, immorality. Trouble was a pastime and entertainment for me. Um, I was an angry person, had a lot of, I don't want to say hatred, but I felt like the world owed me something, and so I didn't really care about people if they didn't have anything to offer me. I left the band because I just couldn't, I couldn't pursue it anymore. It was like I knew that what we had lived for and worked for was right over here. But, you know, for me to get it, I had to take one step off this steep cliff and it was going to be my end because I was destroying myself. So uh, I left the band and I just started looking for a church, found a church, started attending and um, my music career kind of went on hold and I never picked it up again. The adventures I had uh, in the music business were many and memorable, but the adventures I have now serving the Lord and being in His kingdom far surpass anything that the music business could have given me or any other thing that this world has to offer. I don't do music as a vocation anymore, but as you can see, we're sitting in a church right now, and this is Calvary Chapel, Old Bridge, New Jersey. Why that is particularly special is because where we were signed to Megaforce Records was in Old Bridge, New Jersey. So when I look at where we were all those years ago in the 1980s being signed and being part of what was called the Old Bridge Metal Militia. To go from that to being part of the worship ministry in a church is uh, not something that I could have guessed would have happened back then. The scripture in Romans 12 too that says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That was the verse that finally did it for me. I realized that I wanted God to change my heart, but for Him to be able to do that, I had to fully change my mind and I had to follow hard after Him. And I decided to do that. I decided to walk in the truth and walk believing that God would, could change everything for me if I would be willing to let Him. And I was. And He did. I'm not of any denomination now, but um, I am a Jesus freak and a holy roller. For me, the kingdom of salvation is God, heaven, as opposed to hell, okay? The kingdom of salvation is heaven, with God, with Jesus. It is a place I believe our spirit goes. When, we, when this flesh dies, we live to die. You know, the only guarantee we ever get in life 
the moment we're born is that eventually we will die. What happens after death? You know, what happens when we all do fade to black and our song is over? What happens to the soul of man? You know, the Bible says that we uh, will stand before God and give an account for our life. The Bible says that we will be judged for every idle word, for every deed that we've committed. We are all sinners. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. You're a sinner. You're a sinner. Everybody, we're all, everyone in the world, we're born of sin, of the first sin. That's just the way that it is. You could say, I'm a good person, Connie. What are you talking about? I'm a sinner. Well, then we come back to some really heavy duty witnessing, like, have you ever lied? I just want to know, have you ever lied? You know, God wants to know, have you ever lied? I don't. Well, if your answer is yes, then already you're a liar, so you're a sinner. I don't, it doesn't matter if you were two years old, or if you're 25 years old, or 60 like me. It doesn't matter. You lied. Have you ever stolen anything? <sighs> yeah. I mean, I first stole when I was five years old, a piece of bubble gum off the little bus that used to come around with candy <laughs> and everything. Okay? If you're going to go there, have you ever stolen anything? If you say yes, then you're a thief too. Okay, so now you're a thief and a liar. Wherever you go in your life and look it over, if you apply the Ten Commandments to that, you're going to find you have sinned. The consequences of rejecting God's forgiveness and the opportunity to become what the Bible calls a child of God or a member of His kingdom, the kingdom of salvation, is that we will remain in the current state of separation from God, but for eternity. We're not going to get a second chance at the gospel. Uh, life now, the life we have now is our one chance to respond to the gospel, to God's offer of forgiveness. And so the consequence is our eternal separation. The kingdom of salvation is about accepting Jesus Christ and believing that you're saved by grace through faith. You need faith. And once you have faith and you open yourself up to God's Holy Spirit, there's that transformation. My testimony is not my message. My message is 1 Corinthians 15, which is uh, that which I've received, I now give to you that Jesus Christ died according to the scriptures and on the third day rose according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. This is what the gospel is. It's God extending his hands to the world, saying there is a problem that mankind in his natural state is separated from me. We were all born as sinners. And the only way for that to change is to be reconciled to God through what the gift that he offers, forgiveness. But it has to be his way. It can't be my way or your way or anybody else's way. It has to be God's way. And God's way of forgiveness is, is providing forgiveness through his very own son, Jesus Christ. He died to save us. Okay, we are saved from our sin. The kingdom of salvation, for me, that's Jesus Christ himself. He is salvation. And everywhere he went, the kingdom was at hand. Everything he did was the coming of the kingdom of God. It's the healing of a world alienated by God. But the kingdom of salvation is what brings us back into communion with our creator. And so now when, when we die, what happens to those in the kingdom of salvation? Well. Death becomes just a transition. It's um, it's a necessary door to walk through, but it's not a it's not one that we need to fear because we know what's on the other side. And so to have that hope for the future, and to have have right now a present peace and a joy of knowing my Creator and being able to commune with Him is an unbelievable gift that money can't buy. Those of you that are not Christian may not understand this, but you can also look it up in the Holy Bible. This is our instruction book for life. It gives us all the answers. I couldn't believe it. I really couldn't believe it when somebody told me that all the answers that I needed in life were in this book. I said, all right, sure. You know, I can't even understand half of it. Well, once I got into it, and I got connected with some people who understand the word, then I realized 
where I was at. Traditionally, we're taught that God exists in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I believe that there's no one that's ever received and been filled by the Holy Spirit who didn't know it because there's an evidence. And with me, there was an evidence. I suddenly received the power to completely. I, I woke up one day and realized I hadn't thought about drugs or alcohol in a long time. And I didn't understand how that could possibly be because that had never happened before. I could stay clean. I could struggle through it. I could white knuckle through it. I could go to lots of meetings, but there would always be the thought. And all of a sudden there wasn't the thought. And it was as if it had never taken place. If you're willing to change your mind, God will renew everything. It will renew your life. I'm living proof that anyone can change. With the Holy Spirit within us, we are called. We are called to do like my brother did, okay? Apply ourselves in life. Focus. Have a focus. Going forward, keep going forward, no matter how many times you are thrown down, put down, how many times Satan attacks you and comes against you and ruins the whole thing, right? God will carry you through. He carries us through, truly. When I first kind of started writing my own music and started like getting really passionate about music, was during like a really difficult time in my life when I was really just struggling with finding purpose and trying to find a reason for existing, trying to find, you know, really a search for, you know, a better relationship with God. This kingdom of, self of salvation has given me purpose, um, direction, friends, family, a life worth living, and an eternity worth looking forward to. To say it's played a, the kingdom of salvation has played a large role in my life is an understatement. I would just say, just remember that we're all human. We're all sinners in need of a savior. We're not perfect. To look past the people part and see the Jesus part. And that's the part you need. Kingdom of salvation, um, to me it means like the, just the community of followers of Jesus Christ, like all of us together, working together becoming one community. It can be the church. It could be community of Christians in bands. It could be a community of people that follow Christian bands that are just together doing Kononia, if you want to be like that. It's just everybody, the people who fellowship together and praise Jesus Christ. Like that's the kingdom of salvation to me. God gave you this drive to want to create things and to um, express myself in these musical ways. And so to me, like anything I play, will be an act of worship. Playing Cliff Burton stuff for me is an act of worship, and anything that I do in terms of music will be for God. In this life, we, the kingdom of salvation, the kingdom of heaven, the, you know, Jesus, he can give us a lot of that purpose that we need to, you know, to keep going, to keep, you know, for musicians to keep creating, to keep playing music, to keep finding new ways to do things, and even for non-creative people, just to keep just keep living, just to keep, you know, experiencing life for every day for what it's worth. And that's been my experience with how the Kingdom of Salvation has given me hope in this life. This guitar that I played, it's the Lion and Lamb Tetelestai caster. Tetelestai, what does that mean? It's a phrase, it's a term that Jesus said on the cross. It was some of his last words and he said, it is finished. And what it means is that everything that needed to be accomplished in order for humans to have a way to be forgiven for their sins and to be able to come into the biblical kingdom of salvation was completed and done at the cross when Jesus Christ died at Calvary approximately 2,000 years ago. So Cliff, unfortunately, he died. He died at age 24. It's important to realize that the bell tolls for everyone. 10 out of 10 people die. It's the ultimate statistic. So whether you die early, unfortunate death at age 24, or age 44, 54, or even 94, you're going to pass away from this earth and you're going to meet your maker. That's why it's important to key into what's been shared throughout the entirety of this documentary. If you've heard what's been shared in this documentary, it's been the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I wanna encourage you, even as you listen to me speak right now, wherever you are in the world, you can cry out to God, you can confess your sins, you can turn from your sin, and you can trust Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, 
And when you do that, then you can enter into the biblical kingdom of salvation and you avoid the consequences of unbelief. And I strongly encourage you to do that. I did it about 17 years ago and I have no regrets. So my prayer for everyone watching this video is that you would do the same. You don't have to be perfect to be a Christian. Just come as you are, even though you're not a perfect person. Find where you fit in the kingdom and just jump in with both feet. Just 100% go for it. If you're coming to faith, find a Bible teaching church, get there fast. If you ask God to show you, then it will be a natural process that happens of things where you begin to go, wow, this isn't a coincidence. This is no accident. This is not gonna happen. Things just don't happen. When enough of those things build up inside, you're gonna go, okay, hi God, how you doing? And you love me anyway? What? That's what the kingdom of salvation is. Let your minds be open for a minute, you know? Just check it out. When a man lies, he murders some part of the world. Okay, can you give me like a clap right in front of your face? Perfect. All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> we're not on, are we? Yeah. We are? Yeah. Which is right. Cut that. Cut. <coughs> what an idiot. Do you like my hairstyle? It's great. I don't have too much glare, do I? <laughs> I need to step out and powder my head. <laughs> These are the pale deaths which men miss call their lives. behind-the-scenes stories of things that may have happened when Cliff was recording his bass parts for Kill Em All? I don't. I, I don't have any answers for that. I'm sorry. That's fine. Yeah, man, I'm going to have a hard time doing this because I look at people. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be tough. Could you, could you, like, do you have a screensaver of yourself that you can <laughs> put over there? Kill Em All to me just has this wild, chaotic energy to it where... <clears throat> sorry. It's got this um, this wild chaotic energy. Would you be down to talk without your glasses? Yeah. Sure. Just take a piece of my personality right out of the film. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Should I even start by saying something about the influence of Cliff Burton and his music on my own life and ministry? I mean, you think I should? I don't know. I don't even know what this thing's about. You don't? All right. Hello, my name is Ben Champlin. I'm recording a interview today. I'm testing the audio. That's what I'm doing. Ben Champlin. Here we go. Take two. All this I cannot bear to witness any longer. Cannot the kingdom of salvation take me home?